dealt with drinking, now we're dealing with wives submit, okay? And it's so easy from a secular perspective to think, well, Paul wrote that, you know, chauvinist. Isn't it funny that the way everybody handles stuff today is you just name the other person whatever you loathe, you know, sexist, xenophobic, homophobic, despot, whatever. Where, where has gone reasoning in our day? You know how the Lord says, come now, let us reason together? You know what people do nowadays? They just talk over their opponents. But let's reason for a minute, okay? Do you really think that God who made everyone and loves everyone condones chauvinism? Do you think God is tyrannical? Now remember, the scripture was written by inspiration of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's true that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. He was the amanuensis, if you will. He was the male secretary that God used. But God's the author. Very interesting. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Very interesting. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Gentlemen, you and I are not to lord it over somebody else's wife or any of the other women in the church. Wife's told to submit to her husband. Sometimes I've been in churches where men thought they had, a, you know, they had an up over all the other women. I don't have any right to tell your wife what to do. And by the way, I don't have the right just to tell my wife, do it, Angela, because I said so. We've been married 27 years. I'll tell you, I hated leaving Angela today. I, I love my wife more than I ever have. I don't know what I'd do without Angela. And uh, marriage is not wonderful because somebody has the upper hand over the other. This principle is predicated or, or prefaced by the verse before submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There have been times in our marriage where Angela and I talked, you know, when it's, and we live in a fifth wheel trailer. It's hard to, to keep our kids from our conversations because they live, you know, 30 feet down the hall. They can hear everything. Uh, but there are times she and I have talked about, and I said, hon, I know you don't understand this right now, but, you know, I, I think we've got to do this. And she'll go along with it because I, I have often told her, honey, when we stand before God one day, I don't just answer for Rich. I answer for the whole family. And I'm not doing this to be, you know, a jerk or to be stubborn. And we have this mutual respect one for another. I ask Angela all the time, what do, you, what do you think about this? I'm thinking about doing this. And she's very attuned to the kids' personalities and their needs more than I am, you know. So I realize that. She said, I think I, that's going to come across harsh. You know, we might need to think about how we, how we discuss that. How many times uh, you've heard that Pilate, you know, was warned by his wife, have nothing to do with that that man, speaking of Jesus, there's a reason God gave you a wife. There's a reason that, that a car has an accelerator and a brake. Okay, and sometimes we, we are the other person's opposite of that. Okay, you, don't, you ever notice how opposites attract? If you were identical, we wouldn't need each other, right? It's amazing how opposites attract because that's balance in life. So wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Okay, so let's talk about her for a minute. Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord, and then reverence your husband. Drop down to the very last verse of the chapter, verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife sees uh, see she reverence her husband. The word reverence is to show respect to. One of the most insightful books I ever read on marriage was the book called Love and Respect. You read that, Pastor? Yeah. Did you? Emer Emerson Egerick. And again, you know, I think if I ever write a book, I'm going to put a disclaimer in the preface to my own book. I do not entirely endorse the contents of this book. My own book. Because I'm not God, you know. So when I get to heaven one day, I'll say, oh, I thought that. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, any man writes something, he's not going to be perfect on anything. But I'll tell you, that was a really good book on the principle of marriage. And we all know God tells husbands to love their wives. And every wife knows a husband should love his wife unconditionally. But Egrix makes the comment in his book that a wife should respect her husband unconditionally. Hmm. Well, how can I do that? He doesn't deserve it. Well, think about this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When God looked down from heaven, did he look down and say, oh, what a bunch of cute, cuddly sinners? No. <laughs> he saw a bunch of despicable reprobates. But he loved us despite ourselves. And, and, and the very first verse of Scripture I ever taught my children, we love him because what? He first loved us. You know why I love God? He loved me first. That's why I love God. And men, when you love your wife unconditionally, that's, that's going to evoke a different response. And if you try to lord it over or boss your way or be a selfish, chauvinistic pig. But wise, I'll tell you something. When you reverence your husband, how do you do that? 
Honey, I want to thank you. You know, you always put gas in the car. Well, that's the problem. He doesn't. Okay. Find something he does. Okay. You go to work. You bring home a paycheck. You've, you've never left the kids in me. You know, you shovel the snow or you get the snowblower out or at least you bought me the snowblower. You know, find something that you could respect. It's really true. You get what you praise. I'm jumping my, ahead of myself here for a minute, but let me just give you one of the most priceless principles of parenting I ever learned. Okay, and I'll, I'll bring it up in the next section, but this works for marriage too. Try to practice 10 parts of praise for every one part of correction. Try to practice 10 parts of praise for every one part of criticism. If you're harping on your kids all the time, it's no wonder they don't want to hear from you. What if that you were praising every good thing you could find? My, my 10-year-old, my, all my girls are artistic and creative. My, my oldest daughter is a graphic designer. They're all creative. But my 10-year-old, she puts out, she makes bracelets, braided bracelets for people, and she's always making cards, and she goes to Hobby Lobby and gets these little wooden figures and paints them for people, always creative, creative, creative. And she always wants me to admire her art. And frankly, there's so much of it, it's just like every day, yeah, that's nice. I, I have to make myself say, oh, that is really good, Lene. That is really thoughtful. But you know what? When I take time to say, that is really good. Oh, honey, that was so thoughtful of you to do that. When I do have to correct her, it's a whole lot easier because I'm trying to constantly find the good to praise. I want to tell you, you have to look for things to praise. You know, it's true in your marriage, too. Ladies, when you say to your husband, I'll tell you what, hon, thank you for shoveling the walk. Thank you for scraping the ice today. Thank you for turning the car on and having the defroster go so the window would be cleared for me. Thank you for whatever it is. You know, thanks for <laughs> cleaning the dog hair off the couch. Whatever, the, whatever it is, find something to praise. I'll tell you, the more praise... Boy, it's, it's, you know why we put oil in cars? Ladies, you maybe have thanked your husband. Thank you for keeping oil in the car. Yeah, it doesn't run well without it. You know why? Viscosity, you know, there's, there's uh, the grinding of parts on parts, and that oil goes in. It lubricates the mechanism, the gears. And, and the oil is like the peace of God that passes all understanding. When, when we bring the... the um, the, the Lord talks about, I'll uh, give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, you know, and the, and the balm of Gilead. It's like that ointment that just, it just takes away the grind in the daily grind. So wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands and, uh, and reverence your husband. Oh, one other thought about submit. Let me just show you this at, a, at 1 Corinthians. Jump over to 1 Corinthians 11 for a minute. And I, I, I don't blame a lot of wives. Like, me submit to him? I mean, honestly, some wives can honestly say, I've got a higher IQ than my husband, you know, or I had more college education than he did, or I make more money than he does, or whatever. We're not talking about, God is not saying women are inferior to men. You know, when the Lord says to show honor to your wife as a weaker vessel, weaker doesn't mean inferior. Let me ask you, what, what's better, a screwdriver or a hammer? Depends on the job, right? What's better, satin or canvas? Well, it depends if you're decorating for a wedding or you're going camping, you know. The material depends on the job, okay. A wife is the weaker vessel doesn't mean she's inferior. How many of you have either been in or are in the military? Anybody ever serve in the military? Okay. How many of you ever served under an officer who was younger than you? Anybody have an officer younger than you? Okay. How many of you ever served under a commanding officer who was shorter than you in stature? Okay. How many of you, sir, this, this will be unanimous, how many of you ever served under an officer you were sure had a lower IQ than you, okay? And yet you had to submit, didn't you? Because if we don't have submission in military, we have disorder, we have chaos. The word submit is to line up under rank. It's a military term. It has nothing to do with the, who's inferior or superior. So look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, verse 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, so the head of the woman is the man, but the head of the man is who? Christ. Guess who I answer to? Answer to the Lord. But what caught my attention there is the last part, and the head of Christ is who? God. Well, wait a minute, he is God. Yeah, let me ask you, is Jesus Christ in any way inferior to God the Father? No, he said, I and my Father are what? One. And yet, Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. 
there is a totally different perspective on submission. Jesus voluntarily submitted to the Father. So, ladies, when the Lord's asking to submit to your husband, it's not because he's in superior. And, and, he, and he doesn't say you're to submit to every man in the church, guys. It's not my job to tell your wife what to do or anybody else's wife what to do. And frankly, it's not my job to boss my wife around. We work as a team. I live in Kansas City. And um, I'm, I'm a Chiefs fan. I live 15 minutes from Arrowhead Stadium. And, you know, I, my team went to the Super Bowl last year. I, between you and me and the fence post, I fully expect them to go to the Super Bowl this year and win it just frankly. And uh, one of the things, yeah, we'll see about the Browns. <clears throat> one, of the, uh, one of the things I've been listening to is coaching concepts. And, and Andy Reid, you know, my friends who are Eagles fans, for years, like, yeah, you guys have Andy Reid. Yeah, we know how that'll work out. I said, Andy Reid's going to win the Super Bowl. I hope he beats the Eagles. And you know, we had one of those discussions. But um, one of the things I listen to is in these organizations where people are happy, one of the reasons they're happy is because everybody gets to exercise their gift with freedom. And they're all united in a common effort. And I've heard this. People that have worked under Andy Reid's coaching scheme, they really like the fact that he's visionary, but he's not dictatorial. We're really wise in a family when we encourage each one in the family to exercise their gifts. And we'll tell you something. When you, 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 you really get what you praise. And if you start praising what good you do see, you're going to get more good. Amazing how that works. So what does he say to the husbands? Um, husbands, love your wife and then live out the picture. Okay? So look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. I tell you, loving a spouse is a command. I remember when I was going through marriage counseling, Angela and I were talking about getting married. I was 26 before we got married. I wanted to be married the day I graduated from college. You know, the Lord just, I, it didn't happen. So I thought, why would anybody need to be told to love their spouse? I can't wait to get married. Well, it's interesting. The word love in Ephesians 5 is the same one used in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten It's the word agapao. You've heard of agape. That's the noun form. You know what that is? That's a self-sacrificing love. It's a love based on volition, based on the will. It's not a love based on emotional or sexual attraction. There are other words in scripture, eros, from which we get erotic, has to do with sexual uh, attraction. Um, phileo is like Philadelphia, brotherly love. That has to do with um, friendship, just uh, I like my friends because we understand each other, we get each other, you know, it's easy to interact with them. There are other words used for love, but the word commanded in scripture is the love of choice and of commitment. I want to tell you something. The number one reason marriages break up in America is I don't think I love them anymore. What if we use that excuse with our children? There'd be a lot of orphan children in this country, you know that? I don't think I love these kids anymore. It's not a matter of whether you feel like it or not. It's a, it's a commitment. By the way, that's the love marriage is built on. It's a commitment. If your marriage is only built on sexual attraction or only built on, you know, we just really have this good chemistry, like personality chemistry. It's not going to last. Because there are going to be days you don't feel like loving somebody. It's not a, love is not simply a feeling. It's a choice. Now, by the way, out of those choice should come all the other aspects of love. But it's based on the foundation of choice. God so loved the world. It wasn't like he was so attracted to us because we were, after all, just worthy of his desires. No, he loved us despite ourselves. That's the kind of love that marriage is built on. It's a love of commitment. I love you. Paul said it this way, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 14 and 15. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. And so Paul wrote to the Corinthians, a church that had given him a lot of trouble. It was a lot of heartache that came out of that Corinthian church to Paul. And he says, but I'm telling you this. He said, I'm going to come again the second time, and by the second letter to the Corinthians, they'd repented. And he said, and, you know, and he says, uh, the children ought not lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He said, and I will very gladly spend to be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. What a picture of love. And, and the Bible says men are to love their wives just like Christ loves the church. Boy, how, how is that exhibited? Well, notice this, men, and back in Ephesians 5. Love your wives. Notice verse 26. He loved the church. Verse 25 says, he gave himself for it that he might... 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. See, he's going to bring the beauty out of her. 
Well, it's not that he loved her because she was beautiful. He's, he's going to do everything in his power to see that her beauty comes through. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. That's a reminder. You know, I, get, I, I, I live in a family of all girls. i got three daughters, <clears throat> my wife and then me. So there will be times I'll sit in my recliner. We have a lazy boy in my trailer. And I, my daughter will walk by. I say, honey, could you hand me a glass there? And Oh, Lene, would you hand me the remote? And somebody walks by, hey, honey. And my girls will say, Dad, are your legs broken? <laughs> I hadn't thought about it. You know, I got daughters. I just asked for stuff, and it gets handed to me. And I realize it is just so natural for me to look out for me. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. You know what I do with this body? When it's hungry, I feed it. When it needs exercise, I go out and exercise. Today I got here, only got four hours of sleep last night, so you know what I did? I took a nap. I look out for me, naturally. It's not natural to look out for Angel, that's my wife. But I need to learn to look out for her, just like I naturally look out for the needs of me. Let me ask you, gentlemen, when was the last time you can look back and say, yeah, I see that I'm becoming better at looking out for my wife's need. That's how Christ does it. Love your wives. So, and then live out the picture. The picture, look down in verse uh, 29. No man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. I, I, by the way, because of that verse, I believe that thoughts of suicide do not originate with individuals. I think they come from the enemy of the soul. I think you'd be amazed how many people in churches like yours have thought about ending their lives. I've talked to people, they, they're very transparent, they'll say, I really thought about taking my life. I have pastor friends who have told me, good pastor friends that I've known for decades, I seriously thought about taking my life. Pastors, you think, of all people, they'd know better. Well, and then they didn't know better, they just, they went through the emotions like anybody else, feeling like, you know, I don't think I want to fight this battle anymore. That doesn't come from you. Well, what do you mean? I, it was one, like Satan was telling me, you ought to take your life. No, he'll speak to your mind in first person. I oughta. That's why he says, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He's a liar and the father of lies. You don't have to be demon-possessed to have such th thoughts. The Lord says, no man yet ever hated his own flesh. It's a God-given desire to stay alive. Well, read on to the next verse. Uh, we're members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, they too shall be one flesh. It's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That, that's why I believe that the, the picture of marriage is such a premium in the church. You know, I, I'm, I'm personally of the persuasion that if I ever were to leave my wife or commit adultery, that I would, I would step out of ministry. Now, I never intend to do that, ever. I love Angela with all my heart. Well, couldn't God forgive me? Yes, he absolutely could forgive me. But it's a picture of Christ in the church. And so I, and that's one of the things I pray for my preacher friends all the time. Lord, keep them true to you and keep them true to their spouse, because that's an area Satan would attack, okay? And lest I sow any doubt in your mind, I want to repeat, I love my wife with all my heart, okay? She has been a gem in my life. I don't know what I'd do without Angela. But it's one thing I always pray for her. Lord, keep her heart true to me. Keep my heart true to her. Put a hedge of protection around her. Put a hedge of protection around my girls. But the picture is such that that's an area Satan wants to go after. He wants to attack your family. Think about this. No, no chain is any stronger than the weakest link. No church is really stronger than its weakest families. Satan knows how to go after the weak links so he can pull the thing apart. How many churches have divided over somebody gets all ouchy, ouchy about something and it starts pulling apart at the fabric of the church. Let me tell you, your family's under attack because the enemy knows that's how he destroys this church, how he destroys this nation. Okay? So then verse uh, 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife. Well, we could do a whole conference on that. And then we come to the Children and parents. Okay, now notice he says this to the kids. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, in my Bible, I circled all the key names. Wives in verse 522, husbands 525, children 61, fathers 64, servants 65, masters 69. You might want to circle them or put a box around them. Notice he's saying, okay, how do you live out the spirit-filled life? What are you filled with? How does that play out in your interpersonal relationships? Because 
A Christian is not a Christian based on what he does in church on Sunday. A Christian is a Christian based on how he lives in his home. And I mean, his, his real walk is exhibited in his home and in his business and his everyday life. It's, anybody can play the part in church, but the question is, what are you filled with? So, kids, what does he say? Obey your father and mother. Obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee. Thou mayest live long on the earth. Okay, I don't have the kids here, but let me just touch on this for a minute. There is an important distinction between honor and obey. Okay, so you say to your son, son, I need you to take out the trash. He says, mom, Pitt and Penn State are playing right now. The game's in the fourth quarter. You say, we have friends coming for supper. I need you to take the trash out. But mom, there's only two minutes left. She says, you know in football, two minutes can take a half hour. Now get that trash right now. So he grabs the trash, throws it, kicks the trash can. Okay, so let me ask you, did he obey his mother's command? Technically, he obeyed. Did he honor his mother? No. And he says to honor and obey. You need to teach your children that not only are their actions important, their attitudes are important. Now, a lot more I'd love to say on that, but notice this. There's a, a warning for fathers. Verse 4, you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Interesting. He deals with the ones under authority, but then he goes to the one in authority, and he says, now, dads, I want to give you a warning. Don't provoke your children to wrath. Okay, children are told to honor and obey. Dads are told, provoke not, but bring up. Okay, provoke. What does that mean? It's akin to our word exasperate. How does a father provoke his children to wrath? Last year I was meditating on that because I was going to do a parenting conference in Florida. I already did that uh, back, um, let's see, right after Thanksgiving. I did a parenting conference. And I knew I was going to deal with the topic of fathers provoke not your children. So I started in my prayer list writing down how do dads provoke their children. Several, and you might relate to this from your own upbringing. First of all is anger. Anger. An angry spirit in the father will evoke or will provoke anger in the children. Okay, you, can't, you can't beat the ugly out of a child who is just a reflection of yourself. You remember everything produces after his kind? Dogs breed and they have dogs, puppies, okay? And cats breed and they have cats. And sheep breed and they have sheep. And humans, we just produce after our kind too. You know, you can't beat the anger out of a kid. Angry spirit in the father is just going to provoke anger in the children. By the way, I am, I am absolutely an advocate of correct biblical discipline. And the idea of using a rod was not ever to be abusive. But you read the book of Proverbs, a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. The rod and reproof give wisdom. You know what the rod was? It was like a switch. And it was the idea of a swat on the behind, typically, was to send a message. Th think about this. Pain existed even before the fall of man. We had nerves before the fall. If you put your hand on a hot fire, nerve endings send a signal to your brain. Hey, dummy, move your hand or you're going to burn your hand off. Okay? So it's a warning. Hey, don't do that again. Okay? Before you do great damage, there is a warning. The switch, the rod, that's um, the, the implement, the neutral implement, and reproof, that's verbal correction, give wisdom when a child left to himself bringing his mother to shame. So my parents exercised the rod, but here's the key. Abuse comes when it's done as a means of getting even or done in anger. I remember my children, we would use a little flexible rod, and I would tell them, okay, if you disobey, there'll be consequences. And I remember I would bring them in and say, all right, we, lying, you know, every man's a liar. You just told me this. Was that true? <laughs> you know, they're caught in it. Okay. Now I'm going to give you three swats. And I would tell them, tell them ahead of time, okay, I'm going to give you three. Because they don't, they need to know what are the parameters, okay? All right, I want you to bend over my leg, and I'm going to give you a swat. And we wouldn't humiliate them, you know, it wouldn't be pull your pants down or that kind of thing. But found out one time one of them put on 11 pairs of underwear before the, uh... <laughs> so we had to say, no, you go back and you're not wearing 11 pairs of underwear, all right? But, and it would be one. Two, three. Now, admittedly, I have girls. It's a whole lot easier with girls at times, okay? I will tell you that. But, but you've got to understand how your children are. 
abuse is not corporal punishment. Abuse is the attitude of getting even or I'm going to hurt you. It is not meant to hurt. It's a signal. You don't want to do that. One of my friends was uh, in the Air Force out in Hawaii. We were out in Oahu and up in the middle of the island there's a shave ice place called Matsumoto's. It's my favorite shave ice in Hawaii. Shave ice is kind of like uh, snow cones but really fine and really good flavors and uh, Wayne and his wife Kyun, she's Korean, they were at the uh, Shave Ice place. Across the street was the first congregational church planted in Hawaii. And the congregationalists, that's what D.L. Moody was. That's who brought the gospel to Hawaii. So Kyun was going to go across the street, take a picture of this first congregational church. Wayne is with his little daughter, Loa. She's four at the time. Mom goes across the street. It's a busy road there because a lot of tourists come in Haleiwa. And so um, Lois sees her mommy across the street. She starts to run. And Wayne says, Lois, stop. And Lois stops. <laughs> a car goes roaring by. Wayne, this Army intelligence officer, gets down on his knees. He said, come here, honey. She came and he hugged her. He said, Lois, I'm so grateful you listened to Daddy the first time. Do you see what just happened there? And she started to cry. She thought about, what if I hadn't obeyed Dad? He said, honey, I know you didn't know why I said to stop, but this is why mommy and I have taught you to obey the first time. You must obey. See, the switch is not to punish the child. It's not to hurt the child. It's an attention getter. And you don't break the spirit of the child, but you have to submit the will of the child. And if you do that early enough, and as often as necessary, the Bible says uh, chasing them betimes, as often as necessary, you won't have to do it forever the rest of their life. You, you get a handle on that when they're young. And I will tell you this, if you're building cords of connection with your kids, it'll really help. I'll explain that in just a minute. How does a father provoke his children? One is anger, another is harshness. What I say? Look at me! I'll tell you, if you're that way with your wife too, that's going to turn the children against you. The most important thing, men, that we can do in parenting our children is to love their mother. That's the most important thing you'll do in marriage, in, your, in parenting, is you love their mother. That's their mom. Hey, she's your wife. Before she was their mom, she was your wife. At least it should be that way. She's your wife. You love that wife. Harshness. Um, unreasonable expectations. Unreasonable expectations. Or unreasonable mandates. Have you ever, did you ever have a parent who gave you orders? There was an order for everything. There was a law for everything. Well, you know, not everything has to be regulated. Hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Acting one way in church or around church people in a different way in, in your home. Now, I, I know of a personal situation where somebody I know closely um, when things get heated in their family, they start cussing each other. A Christian leader. They'll start cussing in their home. Well, let me tell you something. It's no wonder the kids don't respect the parents. They'll hear the father stand up and preach, and then they'll hear cussing in the home. That's not right. Not just for preachers, for any of us. Harshness. Inconsistency. Boy, that's another one. Inconsistency. Failure to praise the good. Failure to praise the good. Yeah, ten parts of praise for every one part of Christmas. Um, public correction. Hmm. Don't correct your kids in front of other people. You know, my mom's a grandmother, you know, and, and some, sometimes my, my, uh, my siblings, their families will be there, and, and they'll correct their teenage kids in front of my mom. It bothers my mom, but you know what? And it bothers the kids, too. They don't want to have to. You deal with that correction between you and them, not in front of everybody else. Uh, public correction. Also, imposing childhood dreams on your kids. Dad always wanted to be a ball player, so that's what this kid's going to be. I mean, that's not what the kid dreams about. That's not what God wants for the kid. So imposing your childhood dreams. So fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. One of the best articles I ever read on parenting called Influ Influence Trump's Authority. And this has nothing to do with the current president, okay? Uh, this was written years ago. Carrie Schmidt, and uh, listen to this. He said, do you want your children to love God? You want them to truly enjoy life with and for Jesus Christ? 
There's an unspoken principle that many parents or leaders miss. It's often ignored, unrecognized, or completely invisible, but it plays out in every family and church. It's present in every parenting struggle, every parenting success. It's huge. Stay with me. Influence trumps authority. That's it. End of article. Influence trumps authority. Well, it sounds trite, simplistic, possibly even erroneous. So let's take a look more closely. If you truly desire to bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, you must do more than rule them. You must do more than educate them, manage them, teach them. You must do more than feed, clothe, and house them. You must even do more than pray for them and with them. Frankly, you must do more than love them. You must like them. I'm not talking about a trite, simplistic, surface form of like. No, I'm referring to what the Apostle Paul experienced toward the Thessalonian Christians when he said that he was, quote, gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, and he said, and affectionately desirous of them. They were dear unto us, so much so that he, he and his co-laborers imparted to them not only the gospel of God, but our own souls. These unbelievers turned new believers, turned dynamic church, uh, turned dynamic church, were the beneficiaries of more than ritual ministry or apostolic authority. They were blessed to experience an authentic, passionate, personal, sacrificial relationship with the Apostle Paul. What I believe to be the single most important parenting principle in Scripture is this. Influence trumps authority. You see, no parent ever truly won the heart of a child that he did not like. He goes on to say that Hollywood will spend billions of dollars a year to influence your kids. They don't have any authority over your kids but they have profound influence. You know why? They know what your kids like. And so they have learned to win the heart of your child. He said, now you have authority over the kids. That's God given. But authority alone is not going to do it. You have to have coupled with that influence. And how do you get influence? Do You win their heart. And how you win their heart? It's not harping on them all the time. It's not just, oh, I provide food for this house. Good night, I put gas in everybody's car. Great. But are you grumpy and remind everybody how, how terrible they are all the time and you want them to love you? Huh, we love him because he first loved us. So Pastor printed up some articles here, and I'd, I'd encourage you to take it and read it. We've got some copies up here. And again, this is based on the principle of Scripture. But influence trumps authority. So fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Well, let me give you the last little bit here. Servants and masters. He deals with employees. And notice this, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You know what eye service is? You ever walk into a fast food restaurant? Some teenagers in there on the phone, you know. Others are sitting around, drinking sodas out of the soda machine. All of a sudden, the boss walks in. Man, they're cleaning tables and they're sweeping. And you know what happened? The manager showed up, or the big boss got there. Eye service. They're only serving if somebody's eyes are on them. No, you don't just serve with eye service. The Christian knows this. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. That's what we call the Christian work ethic. You do what you do to the glory of God. It's important to teach our kids that. You don't just work to pay, make a paycheck. You work as to the Lord. So be obedient to superiors. Do service with goodwill. Look to the Lord for your reward. And then bosses, what does he say? Verse 9. Uh, masters, do the same thing to them. Forbearing, threatening. That means don't threaten. Don't try to lord it over people with threats. Knowing that you, your master also is in heaven... Neither is the respect of persons with him. So what do you do as a, as a boss? Serve your employees as you would serve the Lord himself. Isn't that interesting? The boss serving the, uh, the, the employees. Interesting thought. Uh, remember, the Lord rewards according to actions and motives. Interesting. Ultimately, God's your, your rewarder. I'd, I'd love to dive into more of this. I told Pastor, I try to be done no later than 845. So we're 844 right now. Let me ask you this. What are you filled with? 
filled with ambition, filled with anger, filled with self, or filled with the Spirit. We could all say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm filled with the Spirit. Show me the evidence. The evidence is in your heart and in your interpersonal relationships. And here's the wonderful thing. God doesn't just beat us over the head with truth. Ephesians 5.26, he sanctifies and cleanses the church with the washing of water by the word. If tonight your heart is convicted, it's not so God would beat you down. It's that he might build you up. You say, Lord, I need a fresh start in marriage. I need a fresh start in our family. You, you might need to do a family meeting like my dad did. Kids, we've been wrong. Well, yeah, but they're wrong too. Deal with that later. God gives grace to the humble. Will you please forgive us? Let's do this. Let's just bow our heads together. I think it would be good to handle an invitation this way. Just right at your seat there. How many of you would say, uh, hey, Rich, just, just to let you know, there is something that God specifically dealt with me concerning in my interpersonal relationships and my immediate relationship with God. I'm not going to go farther than that, but how many of you would say, I'm, I'm admitting there is something God spoke to me about. Would you hold up your hand? You said, tonight God spoke to my heart. Amen. Why don't you just take a moment or two and speak to the Lord. Lord, change me by your truth. The pastor will come up here in just a couple moments after we have some time to pray. Let's ask God, Lord, use your truth to change me.